Um, if you brought a Bible, you can open it to Luke chapter 22. Ooh. For all of our people who have history with the scriptures, who are imagining for themselves what I could possibly be talking about. All right, you're like, ooh, Luke 22. Um, we feel really privileged to be here. Um, we say that, uh, I believe, every time we come, because it's true. Um, I, I don't necessarily get into all of the, uh, the, the ministry games and the, the plastic stuff and, and all of that. Um, you know, we, we really feel privileged uh, to be here, to be with you guys, to know that now for years... We have had the honor of contributing uh, in whatever minute way it may be or the way that it may seem. Um, it's been a joy to be able to serve the Lord and to align our lives with his purposes and your lives and what all of that has meant towards kingdom end. Um, so it is. It's a real joy for us. Um, my heart is burdened with some things tonight that we'll, we'll get to. Uh, out of Luke 22, but um, just want to say we, we really honor and love your pastors, and Dominic and Jackie are the real deal. Um, I can say that because we've done more than just meetings together. Um, there's a meeting culture, <laughs> right, like where everything is based off of the things that happen in the meetings, um, and whatever that means, but um, real life matters. Uh, character over gifting matters. Um, sincerity and authenticity uh, over influence actually matters. Right? Uh, oftentimes we give people a massive following because they're anointed. Um, but not everybody who has an anointing is actually followable. Because there's more than meetings that matter. Um, and so we really love and honor these guys. Um, it's a joy. And we celebrate what the Lord is doing. We feel a part of the region. You know, we had to bear the cross of I-4 to get over here. <laughs> Coming from the other side of Orlando. I get it. You get it going that way, right? We get it coming this way, and you get it both ways if you go that way and then come back. Um, for those of you that may be pass holders at the Mouse Kingdom, <laughs> <laughs> hey, I mean, whatever. The mouse is going to get his. I understand. I'm not against Disney, <laughs> but whatever. The, the park is cool. We take our kids whenever we have to. Um, it is not enjoyable quality time. It's just not. I've got five kids. You're lying to yourself. It's just not. It's not. And I'm just honest enough to know it. Um, we were just there earlier this year. So for anybody that just thinks I'm hating, like, I mean, we were just there earlier this year. 16 hours. It was wonderful. <laughs> it was. Um, but anyways, we really love these guys. <laughs> so it is. It's a joy to be together tonight. Um, I'm just going to pray, and then we'll jump into... Uh, again, Luke 22, and just some things that I feel for us together tonight. Um, Lord, we love you with all of our hearts. Yes. And uh, though that may just sound like mere words, and it may just be language that we've become familiar with, um, King Jesus, we want it to be real. And we know that there is great work that must happen on the inside in order for those words to carry real weight, um, for there to be substance. Um, we know that, Lord. You said that there are those who praise you with their lips, but their hearts are far from you. Um, we want you to have us and to have all of us. We want to be yours in the greatest way that you know is possible. And so we're asking you tonight for abundant grace to be poured out upon our lives, um, that we might see you just a little bit more than we ever have, 
and in catching a fresh glimpse um, that we might receive grace to make you more of everything than you've ever been in our heart. Um, thank you for the saints in this city, for the bearers of light and hope and power, um, those who carry your life and the announcement of your gospel to this city. May you have your way in this harvest field. Uh, may you do what you know needs to be done in order to knit lovers and laborers together, to have a people that would be witnesses here for your glory and to ready the earth for your return. Um, Lord, we are so desperate for you. And in dark days, we want there to be a shine about our lives. Um, like Paul said in Philippians 2, like bright stars hang our lives in the dark night sky. In a perverse generation, may we be radiant. Um, you said this, that those who look to you, you don't abandon or disappoint, but that our faces would be radiant. That we would be a glowing people in the dark. Um, do this in us, Lord, tonight on what it means to love Jesus. Um, now that may sound a little odd uh, coming from uh, someone who uh, I guess you, you could say, because it is real, uh, walked with the Lord now for two plus decades and feel like I've offered a variety of yeses to the Lord over the course of my walk with him. Um, but those of you that maybe have experienced uh, a marriage covenant, you realize you, you love your spouse the day you're standing at the altar. You love them enough to realize that you've considered the cost and you are choosing to commit the rest of your life to them. So there is a sense of love that's real that has brought you to a moment where you are devoting yourself to someone else for the rest of your days. But then you also realize that over time, that love deepens, it matures. Um, there's something about the conclusion that brought you to the altar initially that continues to crystallize in your heart. And it makes you more sober than you've ever been about the cost of love and also about the joy of love. And in a moment, we're going to look into Luke 22 because it's one of the chapters that give us a scenario that is found in Matthew and Mark. In Matthew, it's Matthew 26. In Mark, it's Mark 14. Um, in Luke, it's Luke 22, 39 to 46. Matthew is 26, 36 to 46. Mark is 14, 32 to 42. Um, and it's Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. And as Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane, he's in the place of prayer and he's in the place of anguish. And he's burdened beyond belief. Um, as a matter of fact, his life is overwhelmed. He says in one of those scenarios, to the point of death, where his anguish over wanting to love his father. We know earlier Jesus would have said specific things in certain places, like, I delight to do the will of the one who sent me. I didn't just come to do my own thing. I'm not just trying to um, circumstantially either leverage or monopolize situations towards my own end. I'm not just trying to piece together my own dreams and connect the dots of my own desires. He's like, I know in a very real way that there's a reason they're crushing. Um, they're absolutely necessary but regardless of how necessary they may be, it doesn't trivialize how crushing they are. And Jesus is in the garden because he is sensitive to something his father is asking of him. And he's in the garden because he's there to pray it out. And this is really important. He is processing his heart in the place of prayer. Because his desire is that the end goal of prayer would be to soften the strength of his will and the resistance 
that is alive, that is being put up against the things that he knows his father is asking of him. And we know that he prays multiple times because sometimes you have to pray it out more than once. Right? I've gone into the place of prayer with something I knew the Lord wanted from me and came out of prayer knowing that I still didn't want to give it to him. Right? I mean, anybody who's going to tell you that everything God has ever asked them to do, they immediately, with overwhelming joy, ran to the starting line to give to God what they knew God was asking them to do is absolutely lying to you. And, and, and anyone who isn't ever challenged in the place of obedience is quite possibly very proficient in living their life by their own wisdom. Because there are seasons and intersections that the Father's leadership will bring us to. Much like Jesus, now not saying that we are going to be exact in the reference point that we're using, but the scenario that is unfolding in the garden is one of a man who is wrestling in the place of prayer, able to identify that there is something his father is inviting him into in a place of obedience that he also realizes there is very real resistance alive in his heart from his father getting the thing that he's asking him for. And we know this because he actually prays it that way. In Matthew, I believe he says, I know that all things are possible for you. That you can do all things. I know all things are possible. In Mark, he says, you can do all things. And in Luke 22, he says, if you're willing, let this cup pass from me. But where he lands is, but not my will be done, but your will be done. Now, now this is something that's incredibly important about processing our heart in the place of prayer whenever we're being challenged in the place of obedience. Is Jesus realizes that there's resistance in his heart. But he also realizes what to do whenever there is a realization of resistance that's alive on the inside. He takes it to the place of prayer and he prays until his heart is yielded to the leadership of his father. He's not in the process of prayer looking for an out or for an advantage. He's not in the place of prayer hoping that his father is going to change his mind or that he's going to receive grace and empowerment to be strengthened in the place of his resistance and his rebellion. He's there to pray it out until, until what? Until his heart bends, until he receives real grace that softens the strength of the resistance that's alive on the inside, until real grace, until real power actually transforms what's happening on the inside. Because his delight is not in just satisfying objectives. Like, well, I know what my father's asking for, and so I just got to figure out a way to get it done. Now, the writer of Hebrews tells us that it was joy. That for the joy set before him, he endured the horrific events of the cross, scorning its shame, going through the public Exile and mocking, being criticized by powers and by people and being left for dead. It was joy that motivated that entire process. So we have to be willing to endure in the process of prayer until grace actually produces joy that comes alive on the inside that cripples the strength of the resistance that used to create hostility to the thing that God was asking me to do. We have to be willing to pray until a real change, until a actual transformation begins to take place on the inside where Previously, the thing that I knew God was asking me to do, I was hostile to. I did not want to do it. I was completely anti. There was no way, no shape, no how, was not going to get done, but I prayed. And maybe I prayed once, 
and nothing actually happened and the resistance stayed alive and I still wanted to rebel, but I prayed again. And Jesus prays until what's happening on the inside gets transformed because he says, I delight to do your will. And when our delight is in the place of obedience, there are inevitably going to be times there is inevitably going to be intersections or scenarios where the Father is asking us to find our delight in him through an act of obedience that is going to demonstrate the affection that we say we have for him. There are inevitably going to be times where the request is to put our love on display in the place of obedience so that the determination of what's actually real in our hearts becomes a demonstration and our obedience creates an evidence that's more than just language. And it's important. It's got to be more than just language. Talking about obeying the Lord is not the same thing as actually doing the thing that God is saying. Sharing it with others, right? Often like we satisfy obedience just in the conversation of obedience and we're like man like I've shared my heart with people and oh brother pray for me I'm not saying those things are wrong I'm not I'm not trying to like minimize that in its influence or in its potency but what I'm saying is is you can have people praying for you for 10 years and you're still not obeying the thing God told you to do so just talking about it just praying about it just having others involved where, where they're a part of the conversation or the prayerful process has to bring us to a point where we do the thing that God is asking us to do. And our doing creates an evidence to the affection that we contain in our hearts that puts a language on display on the platform of obedience. Because Jesus said it himself in John 14, 15. He said, those that love me are the ones that obey me. So the barometer of love is obedience, which is why in Matthew 15, he can quote Isaiah and he can say, there are going to be many that praise me with their lips, but I don't actually have their hearts. They sing songs, they quote verses, they possibly teach and or preach, but I don't have leverage in their hearts for my leadership to get the traction that I desire. And this is the ultimate issue, is the Spirit is looking for traction in our hearts. The Spirit's power is looking to come on us with the harness of love to where, like Jesus says, I know when you love me because those that love me are those that obey me. And later on in verses 21, 22, 23, he says the exact opposite. And in fact, when you're unwilling to obey me, it just reveals that you don't actually love me. So obedience is not an activity issue. It's not striving, grinding, man, I just got to try to, you know, create systems or force myself to kind of do things. No, because it's not duty. He said, I don't feel obligated to do your will. He said, I delight to do your will. And there's a major difference between duty and delight. There's a major difference, but this is one of the agendas in prayer is that in the prayerful process, the person praying is to experience a deliverance from obligation and duty. Prayer and the consequence of praying it out and persevering in prayer. One of the goals of persevering in prayer is so that the person praying can be delivered from the obligatory framework, from the sense of duty, having to do something that you don't want to do. Because I'm telling you, when the Spirit touches you in the process of prayer, it transforms duty into delight. It brings about a real deliverance where what previously was obligation, we can now embody with real joy. And there's an energy that animates us that is otherworldly. Because previously, I was hostile. Previously, there was no way. But when I prayed it out, and when 
God began to work on the inside. And when the Spirit empowered me with real grace and began to transform me, something happened and the resistance died and the strength got weakened and my grip on my own demands and my sense of entitlement to lead my life by my own wisdom, it got conquered. And he's praying it out because he says, I delight to do your will. Man, I'm telling you, some of us need to experience deliverance in the place of prayer from our duty-driven, obligation-oriented, heavy, burdensome, religious, ritualistic, legalistic, taskless-oriented way of walking with Jesus. And there's no joy. And there's no joy because we're trying to love him by our own strength. There's no joy because we're trying to obey him with our own wisdom, with our own means, with fleshly power. But we understand it's not by power and it's not by might, but it's by my spirit, says the Lord. And Jesus has a desire to offer obedience to his father in delight. Because again, the goal is not just to do things. Especially things that you don't want to do. The goal is not just to do things and to become proficient in works or activities with a superficiality to the depth or the genuineness of the love that is intended to motivate the things that we're doing. That's why we are motivated towards good works and love as we were exhorted even before we started. But Jesus realizes that his father wants something from him and he's very aware that what his father's asking him for is crushing his whole life. And, and if you've never had the Lord ask you for something that crushed your whole life, then maybe you don't have a grid for what's happening. And that's okay. Th that's okay. It's coming. I just grow real weary of people that somehow, some way, everything that God is ever saying to them always falls perfectly into alignment with everything they want. Like, like for real. Like, like people that have never graduated in prayer beyond the threshold of their own demands. Like people that somehow only hear God's voice in the area or the channel of everything they've ever dreamed about or desired. Like God is always saying to you exactly what you want. For real? Like seriously? Like maybe I've been walking with the wrong guy then. Like, and I'm not saying like it's cruel and it's right. Like it's, I'm not saying that at all. But what I'm saying is always like always. Like you've never heard anything outside of something you've wanted in prayer? Wow. Uh, that's odd. And he's received a word that's crushing his whole life. And, and one of the reasons that it's so crushing is because it is bringing him to the point where he must surrender his current evaluation of who he is. And this is why we need peace that surpasses all understanding. Right? You, you only require peace that surpasses all understanding when you have to surrender your understanding or when you've been brought to the brink of going absolutely mad in trying to figure God out. When he's saying enough that you know you need to do something, but he's not saying everything that you're demanding him to say so that you can have all of the answers that would create neat solutions to motivate you to do what he's asking you to do. Right? Because often there's an invitation to obedience where you do to the other side. Where you have enough of a vision to know what he's asking you for, but there's not enough that's been put in your vision for you to understand what, a, what is on the other side of the obedience that he's asking you for. And he's asking you to do what he's asking you to do, 
but he's not giving you the motivation of the insight of the steps that are on the other side. And Jesus has to surrender his current evaluation of who he is. The, the format, the form, the way that he interprets his life in an immediate sense. That the incarnation is amazing and Jesus is an incarnate man. But the embrace of the cross takes incarnation to crucifixion to resurrection. Where because of the act of obedience that he is being invited into to embrace the cross. The cross as an instrument of death and the instrument of love is going to transform the form that Jesus has been comfortable in. The form that he's been familiar with. His evaluation or his interpretation of who he is and what his life is about as he is functioning in the place of love and obedience. And the embrace of the cross is scary for those of us that can't see to the other side. Because we tend to fall in love with forms and ideas. And at times we become prisoner to our own evaluation and our wisdom begins to govern. And often it's why we're so challenged in the place of obedience is because I can't make enough sense of what he's asking me to do. And the rival in the evaluation is my wisdom against God's wisdom. And often what wins out is what I think is best. Now, I mean, we wouldn't maybe say it that directly, but often the reason that we are looking for exemptions in the place of obedience or conversations that are going to spiritually sounding justify why I'm not actually going to do what God is asking me to do. Or we look for agreement from others in a shared perspective that will give me enough strength in agreement in order for my heart to be reconciled that I don't actually have to do what I felt like the Father was asking me to do. And it's a wisdom orientation struggle because Jesus is being asked to surrender his current idea of himself. And it's a real challenge because again, we, we tend to become familiar with forms and formats and we so easily get conditioned by the way that things have been, by how we've known ourselves and who we think we are. And, and the majority of that is based off of assignments, right? Where an assignment begins to define us and where we find our value in certain forms or functions. We, we do certain things where we derive a, a sense of life or we create a, a certain appreciation or there's a, there's a value scale to the things that we do. And so our form or our format, we get stuck in. And so when God asks us for a particular instance of obedience that would seem to challenge that, when it would seem to create a, a rival to everything that we've possibly known, it's difficult to imagine the tension that Jesus is under. It's difficult to imagine how crushing a word like this is. But it's the Father's desire to, with incredible love, bring us into a secure place of freedom where he can transform the forms. And with a refiner's fire, he can evaluate the delighting of our heart. Because the goal is to experience resurrection for Jesus and for him to graduate to ascension. But in order for him to do that, he has to submit himself to a process that is going to crucify the current form. And he wants to do it with joy. Doing it with joy is important because obedience is an expression of love, but it's also a demonstration of worship. And we have to connect obedience and worship. Otherwise, we will often find ourselves minimizing the importance 
of things that God is asking us to do. Whether it be private, unseen, hidden, personal things, issues that that there's going to be no lights, camera, action. It's not going to be a podcast episode. You know, just whatever. I'm saying things that you know the Lord is trying to bridle you in the place of loving obedience with. Personal matters. Or whether it be public things. Exploits, alignments, certain activities, expression, whatever. Whether it be personal or public, we have to make the connection that obedience is an act of worship. And the reason that I say that is because the first instance where we find worship in the scriptures, we're, we're familiar with this, is a man that is being crushed by possibly the most difficult invitation to obedience he's ever received. Right? A- Abram is now Abraham in Genesis 22. 75 when the Lord visits him in Haran in Genesis 12. He has walked with God now for decades. Decades. But we know that because when he has Isaac, he's around 100. Isaac is now older, young adult age, possibly. This is a man that has walked with God for decades. And in Genesis 22, the first verse says, and after some time, God circled back around to test the heart of Abraham. Now, you see, the way that you and I think, um, we would be very quick to consider, like, man, this is a guy that has walked with you for decades. Now, I mean, he's not always been perfect, like we get that. But he's loved you. He's obeyed you. He's sacrificed. He's honored you. He's tried to do the things that you've asked him to do. Like he has proven himself now for decades. Like leave that man alone. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, come on, man. Like decades now. And this is the guy that you're going to test? And it should just provide a fresh encouragement to all of our hearts that we are never going to find ourselves beyond the reach of God in our lives to test the ultimate delights of our heart. Where the Lord is until the day he comes going to be interested in what is the ultimate consideration on the inside of our hearts. And he comes to Abraham in order to test him because he's trying to find out if any other thing has eclipsed him as a priority in Abraham's heart. And he says, I have to ask you to do something in order to find out. We just trivialize obedience so often. And sometimes I feel like obeying and sometimes I don't. And sometimes when I agree, like, uh, man, I determined it's worth it. I determined, like, you know, it's going to get me somewhere or it's going to connect these dots or, or whatever, whatever incentive there is. And other times I just don't feel like it. Right? Or I count the cost and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's not for me. But he comes back to Abraham and he's like, I'm going to ask you to do something. Because in what I'm asking you to do, on the platform of your obedience is going to provide the evidence of your affection. Obedience is an evidence of affection. Obedience is a demonstration of worship, but it is an evidence of affection, where we begin to, as a living witness, actually demonstrate a testimony of love through obedience to the Lord. And he says, I'm going to ask you to do something. And in what I'm asking you to do, it's going to test what's important to you. Man. In what I'm asking you to do, I'm going to investigate where you find your real and true delight. Is it in me? Or is it in things I've given you? Is it in something that I'm doing in your life? Is it in something that that you just, you you desire or demand or, or whatever? And he says, bring your son to the mount that I'm going to show you, right? Abraham gets up early the next day. He's journeying. After three days journey, they come to the mount. And at the base of the mount, Genesis 22, 5, Abraham says, you guys stay here. This is between us and God. 
And he says, me and the boy will go to the top of the mount to worship. And the first instance where worship is referenced in the scriptures is in the context of a man desiring to bring the Lord a yes that he's asking for. And having his whole life crushed at the thought of not being able to see clearly enough to the other side, but knowing what it is. Now, now I also get it because the writer of Hebrews says Abraham was convinced that God was able to raise the dead and that's what motivated him to bring Isaac. But the idea there or what's being implied is he actually thought he was gonna have to kill it. Right, he didn't have the end of the story to read it into the beginning to lighten the load of what God was asking him for. Right, we do that with Job. Double for your trouble. It's like, well, brother, just like Job, God's going to give you double for your trouble. Do you know what type of anguish Job went through to get that double? I've got five kids and my wife is 21 weeks pregnant. So we have a little girl coming. I have five kids right now. We're not talking about chicken nuggets. Right? You just can't swap them out. You know what I'm saying? Like, well, I'll give you three. You give me those three. It's like, well, or chips or something. Well, I like the open ones. You like the bent ones. Like, we'll just trade. It's like Job's life was devastated. And he didn't have chapter 42 to read into chapter 1 to create a motivation for him to actually walk things out in a certain way. And Abram goes to the top of the mount to worship because he wants to bring the Lord the yes that he knows he deserves. And Abraham is challenged, I am sure, as we've all been in the place of obedience with different things that God has asked for us. Uh, I remember the last time that we were together, which would have been in June, um, Zeal for His House Conference. Um, we would have been a week out from experiencing a miscarriage. Um, Anna had a miscarriage on the day of Pentecost. Uh, we were actually at the To Gather event. I, I should say we. It was me and some of the brothers and leaders from our church. Um, Anna was at the house. We had a corporate meeting for our church in Orlando that day. And I came out to pray because I was asked to be there for Israel. And just a couple of minutes before I am to go up on the platform, I'm getting text messages and a phone call from my wife who is going through a miscarriage at the house. Um, now this is after, when I say the Lord was after us for several months, that's exactly what I mean. Uh, the Lord was after us for months in the place of inviting us to have another child. And uh, I remember, many even use my kids. Like my kids prayed for a sibling for probably five or six months, to the point where I was like, guys, enough. Like, no. <laughs> like, that's not how it works. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, no. Like, they ask for pets all the time. They're like, Dad, when are we going to get a pet? We're not getting a pet. We have a lot of people in this house. You know what I'm saying? Like, we, we take care of humans here. There's seven of us, and then often other people living in our house and, and frequenting staying. And, and like, no, is no, just no. And they were on it. I mean, there'd be times where they'd lay hands on mom, like, just get pregnant already. It's like, guys, stop the madness. Oh, no, for real. And I remember one night sitting in prayer together as a family because... Uh, I don't want to say every night, it may be a little a bit of a stretch, but as much as we are able to, nightly, we are together in the place of prayer as a family. And I remember one night, um, the Lord, when they started praying for a sibling again. And I was like, what is happening, man? <laughs> like, it's not like we don't have any kids. You know what I mean? It's not like I've got none or one. Like, I feel like we're doing our part, you know? (laughs) 
not that it's a burden. I'm not saying that it's, a, it's not a burden for sure. Um, and I remember the Lord was like, listen to them. And I was like, what? And I was like, no, no, listen to what they're saying. And he said, they're praying the evangelistic prayers of the church. I was like, ah, I don't understand. I, 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 I don't understand. And the Lord was like, what they've experienced together in me, in family, has been so amazing to them that they are actually crying out to me to add people to the equation. And I was like, oh, that's not fair. <laughs> like, that's not fair. Like, that, it's just, that's not fair. Like, so, like, Ay, ay, ay. And so I was like, okay. So I remember, <laughs> I remember hesitating and saying, babe, I feel like we, we at least need to pray about this. And we were scared to even pray about it. Because it was like, man, I know what's going to happen. And we started to pray. Um, and the Lord obviously softened our hearts and changed in a radical way our perspective towards the invitation. Um, and we gave ourselves to the process, and Anna ended up getting pregnant. And I remember we waited weeks and weeks and weeks before we told our kids. And we told our kids on a Friday night, and that Sunday was the day of Pentecost. So we told our kids Friday night, and my older three just broke down crying immediately. Like immediately. Like, man, God heard us we won, you know what I mean, kind of stuff, like, <laughs> like, get some of that, mom and dad, like, you said no, God said yes, <laughs> you know, it's like, but the joy was just through the roof, right, and then Sunday morning, the difficulty and the devastation of experiencing the miscarriage, um, because what, what you realize over time is that obedience doesn't always go the way you think it's going to. And it's why our delight and our joy has to be anchored in the Lord and not in outcomes. We don't obey outcomes, we obey Jesus. And Jesus is our motivation because Jesus is our vision. And, and often, I, I don't, I don't know if there's been many times over the course of my walk with the Lord where he's guaranteed me certain outcomes. Now, we develop expectation out of our own perspective on matters and out of our own decisions to create certain frameworks and ideas. We motivate our hearts with certain ideas. But we obey the Lord. And I remember having to sit with our kids and having to go through the whole process and, you know, just again, um, having to go through the process because in 2020, we experienced a miscarriage in between our two little guys. Um, and now to be here again, you know, I remember in that season saying to the Lord, man, I don't know if I could ever bear that again. I don't know if my heart, and without him, it doesn't. I don't know if my heart has what it takes in order to survive another moment like that. Um, and God gives grace, and he's amazing, and he does great things. Um, but, but I just remember being scared to death and now having leverage in the conversation of why I didn't want to obey the Lord. Right? Because even though the outcome was difficult in an immediate sense, the word of the Lord was still inviting us to a particular conclusion. And having to really, with desperation, ask God to give us grace as a family and to strengthen our confidence to be willing to trust him and believe him again and put our lives in another vulnerable space. Right? If you've ever tried to obey God and had it not go the way you thought it would, had things falter or fail, had things fall apart, uh, had a radically opposite outcome to what you were praying through and actually uh, being obedient towards. And we just asked the Lord for real grace. And I remember one morning in prayer, 
um, speaking in prayer and just going back and forth with the Lord. And I remember I was like, Lord, I'm looking for unique leverage in prayer, right? Like, I got to find a certain way to pray about this where God's going to let me out, right? Like, I got to find the right angle to come at it in prayer so that I get the loophole that I'm looking for, right? And I'm like, Lord, I'm going to be 42 next month or in a couple of months. Like, Abraham is amazing, you know what I mean? Like to talk about, preach about, pray through. I don't want to be Abraham though. Like I'm going to be 42. I feel like I already have a lot of children. Like I remember the Lord saying back to me, I'm sorry. I didn't know that you had plans. Oh, this is hilarious. He was like, I I didn't know that you had an idea of what your life was supposed to look like where my voice and leadership has become an inconvenience to you. I'm sorry, man. Like, I didn't know that there were things you were thinking about your life that weren't lining up well with what I was asking you to obey me with oh, talk to me about these plans. Let's talk about these plans. Let's talk about your plans that are in the way of you obeying me. I don't know about these plans. Let's have that conversation. And I was like, seriously? Like, he's like, where are you getting this definition of success? What are you looking at? What are you being influenced by? Where are you receiving inspiration as to what real success looks like for you and in your life? Is success actually found in the consistency of loving obedience? Or is it found in these other metrics that you're employing in order to determine a certain vision or value for your life? where now what I'm asking you for is actually becoming problematic to you, right? And I'm not not sharing because I'm sure some of us are like, oh man, he's gonna ask us all to have babies. And it's like, (laughs) no. I I mean, unless that's what the Lord is saying to you, you know? I'm not saying everybody's supposed to rush out and have more children, Right? I have to obey the Lord, as for me and my house. But what I am asking you is what area, what space or place or conversation of your life is God's voice off limits? Where are you no longer subject to the influence of the voice of the Lord? Where have you figured things out for yourself? All right, often it's like, well, I need the Lord's help here. I need breakthrough here. I'm asking God to advance his cause or his purposes in this area. But these three things, leave me alone over here. Don't touch this. Right? I'm not, I'm not open to intercessors and prophetic words. Like, don't lay hands on me. Don't try to tell me anything that God is saying. Like, these things are immovable in my life because I've got them exactly where I want them to be. We would say things are going well here. But who determines what's going well? Because to us, nothing may be wrong, but to the Lord, it doesn't also mean that everything is right. We often determine what's right by the avoidance or the elimination of pain, pressure, inconvenience, where to the Lord, at times, he will directly walk us through those things in order for the evidence of our ultimate delight in him, creating the necessary exposure of what is creating resistance in our hearts to actually loving him the way that he's asking to be loved. 
Because this is what he says to Abraham. Bring the boy to the mount. He gets to the top of the mount, right? In verse 12, he lifts his hand to actually slay his son. And the voice of the Lord speaks to him and says, wait, wait, wait. I didn't actually want you to kill him, right? It's why we have to keep on hearing. <laughs> oh, it's really important. <laughs> so you don't kill things you're supposed to keep. <laughs> um, but he says, wait, wait, wait. I didn't actually want you to kill him. I just had to know. I had to know where your heart was at. I had to know if anything had eclipsed me in the place of your affections. I had to know if I was still the ultimate thing in what you delight in. And a conversation isn't going to suffice. You just can't be like, you're my everything. Okay, awesome. Well, I'm going to ask you to do something that's going to test that. And I'm going to invite you to obey me in particular ways that are going to evidence that affection that you claim. I'm going to ask you to set your life up in certain ways where you're going to practically, right, where God's influence gets into the practicalities of our life, where the leadership of the Spirit gets traction in the practicalities of little spaces, large spaces, unseen realities, visible things. He says, because I had to know where your heart was at. This is a man who's decades into walking with the Lord. And the Lord is still interested in the investigation of what's going on in his heart. And he says, you actually had to do something in order for it to reveal that what you said had substance to it. And it's just absolutely necessary. And it's why we can't trivialize the Lord asking us to love him certain ways. Because he is going to ask you to love him in certain ways. That at times might make sense to others. In other times makes absolutely no sense to others. But the evaluation is not the opinion of a person that is watching you love him. The evaluation belongs to the one that's asking to be loved. It belongs to Jesus. And at times, others will be disinterested in the way the Lord is asking to be loved. Right? In John 12, we have a story where Jesus is in Bethany. He's at the home of Simon the leper. He's reclining. We know Mary and Martha are there. Lazarus is there. He's been raised from the dead. It's super hilarious to me. They say they're still trying to kill him. Um, you know, they're trying to figure out a way to kill him, even though Jesus has raised him from the dead. Lazarus is there. Um, Pharisees are there, disciples are there. And the story is actually, now if it's the exact same account, there's a wrestling there, but the similarity in the story is in Matthew 26, Mark 14, Luke 22, and also in John 12. And in John 12, verses 1 to 8, it says that a woman breaks in. And she breaks in with a box of costly ointment or perfume. And she breaks in with this box to break it open in the place of worship, and to pour it out on Jesus. Now, now, amazing enough, John is great because he provides details about what happens after she does this. And it says that those that were there became indignant, that they were bothered, they were frustrated, some were infuriated. And their consideration or their evaluation of what's taking place is, why would you waste that? And Judas, who's there, says that could have been used, because it's about a year's wages, that could have been used in order to benefit the poor. But John is amazing because he's providing insight and details. And he says, John or Judas, John tells us, Judas is not saying this because Judas is actually interested in the poor. He's saying this because he's a thief. And because he was the one that would oversee the money box. And with the transactions that were taking place, he was pilfering the money box. And it happens so easily that oftentimes we miss it when it's taking place. 
their evaluation of what one considered to be worship. What one considered to be worship, another considered to be waste. What one considered to be the exuberant act, the evidence of affection in the place of obedience and worship, what one thought was the evidence of affection in the place of worship to another was considered to be a waste. And it was considered to be a waste because Judas was more aware of the value of the money than he was the value of the man Jesus. And when other things begin to eclipse the beauty and the value of Jesus in our hearts, we will come up with great sounding conversations in order to exempt ourselves from the evidence of affection in obedience that is considered to be an act of worship to the Lord. And we will come up with a variety of ways to justify a particular perspective, a particular posture, a particular rebellion that we're living in, meaning we're not willing to do the thing that God is asking us to do, and we've become a professional in the way that we can talk our way into a position that excuses us from having to do it. But Judas is more aware of the value of the money, and the money has become priority. The value of the money has ascended in his priorities. The value of the money, the love of the money, his benefit and the leverage from the money. I mean, my God, he actually transacts for 30 pieces of silver the life of Jesus. The heightened value of money. No, no, this isn't like a money thing because for you it could be something entirely different. For, for all of us, it's different things. It's a variety of things. You're like, well, my issue is not money. It's like, okay, maybe not. But when the issues of our heart begin to rise in value over the beauty and the value of Jesus, we, by our own wisdom and conversation, begin to excuse ourselves from the place of worship, which is the evidence of our affection in the place of obedience. And Judas considered it to be a waste, but to the woman, it was worship. And it's just, it, it's, it's wild how it begins to take place. Because to the one that considers it to be a waste, our evaluation of others, where we become critical of their exuberance, we become critical and pointed and slanted towards their demonstration of love. I remember when I got born again, some older folks in the church, and I only say that because I was in my 20s and they were, they were later on in life. Um, they said to me after a gathering one day, don't worry, son, eventually you're going to become like the rest of us. And I was like, well, my Lord, I'd rather die. <laughs> like if that's a vision of what's coming, like this thing ain't worth it. You know what I'm saying? And if it is worth it to you, like somebody needs to tell your face. <laughs> right? If you're happy and you know it, then your face will surely show it. <laughs> your face is showing that something's going on in your heart. And I don't want to become like the rest of whatever you that means. But when other things eclipse the value of Jesus in our hearts... We become so critical. We begin looking at other expressions. It doesn't take all that in worship. Man, I'm just telling you, that's just too much. You guys are just extra. Like, ah, man, you don't got to worship that long. You don't got to be that loud. You don't got to this. You don't got to that. And we excuse ourselves from the demonstration of worship as an evidence of affection. We become easily removed from delighting in God and allowing our life to be a living witness that tells the world he's worth it. If there's anything that I want my life to be known for, it's love for Jesus where the testimony of my life says to him and to people and to powers, 
He is worth it. Well, he's worth what? He's worth everything. He's worth anything. He's worth anything that he asks for. He's worth everything that he's looking for. He's worth the box of ointment. He's worth taking the boy to the top of the mount. He's worth pressing in in the garden and lingering with him when he's looking for a friend to stand beside him to tend to the burden of his heart. Whatever it is that he's looking for, he's worth it. And if there's something that I want my life to say, I want my life to say he's worth it. He's worth it. And this is what the leadership of the Spirit is looking for. And it's the issue that now, hear what I'm going to say. It's the issue. It is the issue. Is currently your life is revealing the worth of Jesus in your heart. Your life right now is telling him and others what he's worth to you. The value of Jesus is on display in your life. And this isn't some like critical thing. But I wonder, do others look at us and come to the conclusion, he's worth it? You, you, would, you would never understand them unless you saw him the way they saw him. Right? Isn't that what she says in Song of Songs, chapter 5? Like, I was asleep, but then he touched my heart. And I was awakened. And my affections came alive. And the way that he touched me actually put me in motion. And I went looking for him. And it, it did something to me. And it just made me mad. Right? And when they ask her, like, why are you like this? She's like, have you seen him? Well, I'll just tell you, you'll never understand me. Unless you've seen him the way that I've seen him. That's not to boast. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Right? Psalm 34, verse 8 means something. It's not, oh, taste and see that materialism is amazing. It's not, oh, taste and see that popularity is everything. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. And when you taste of his goodness, it begins to unravel the appetite that at times wins in the evaluation Right, he says, restore to me the joy of your salvation and take not your Holy Spirit from me. It's not don't take my platform away. Don't take my social media following. Oh God, I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have it. It's none of these things. It's don't take the precious power of your spirit that's with me and working in me. It's your spirit that's working in me in order to produce what it is that you've been promised. The spirit is working, yes, in our lives personally, but throughout the nations of the world to produce this people for Jesus to create and to make ready this people. And I say create meaning a new creation. To create and make ready a people whose hearts are going to burn with him as their ultimate interest. Right at the end of the age, it will be the spirit, yes, crying out for something, but it will also be the bride. And the spirit and the bride will be unified in what their ultimate issue is in what their ultimate interest is. And the Spirit's power will get traction in the hearts of people to where all of the other competition, all of the other rivals, all of the other issues that create the buffers and the insulation that oftentimes lull us to sleep with visions of things that are just, they're just immediate and worldly. 
right? They're just, they're, they're based out of desires and they're not necessarily oriented to a biblical vision or a kingdom matter of sorts. And I'm not saying that like dreaming with God is ultimately wrong, right? Like, like don't, don't hear it that way. But what I am saying is the spirit's power is working in the hearts of people in order to make ready a people that are going to cast off every other thing and issue that has created resistance in the place of love. And they're going to be real about the evaluation of their heart because God's interests will be investigated looking for the evidence of affection in the place of obedience. And we will come to intersections where we have to conclude, if we do it, he's worth it. But if we don't, it's not because, like Judas said, man, there was a better use of resources. Like you could have allocated those funds to a different place that would have been more beneficial. Right? In that issue, you're not saying um, that the time's not worth it, that the resources aren't worth it. You're not saying that like, man, I thought about it and I've got a better use of my life and the effort of my life or the resource of my life, whatever. The ultimate issue is somewhere in your heart you've determined he's not worth it. Because when he's worth it, you do anything for love. And they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of the testimony. Loving not their own lives. You do anything for love. I'm telling you, when he's touched your heart and your affections have come alive, there's nothing I wouldn't do. There's nowhere I wouldn't go. Now, that's going to be tested and God's going to have to give grace. And it it might require lengthy time in prayer in order to bring me to the place where I can rise from prayer in order to do the thing that he's asking me to do. But I want him to get from me whatever it is that he is looking for out of me. And often when we just decide that we're not going to do it, it's not because of whatever other things we've concluded aren't worth it. Ultimately, the issue is he's not worth it. And somewhere in my heart, his worth has not conquered the value of whatever other thing it might be that's providing enough of a fight to win. And it's a difficult place at times to have to surrender your wisdom, your perspective, your understanding. I I get it. Right? I'm, not, I'm not saying like, oh, this is so easy. Why isn't everybody doing it? Jesus is literally praying blood out of his face. He is being crushed in the place of prayer. But again, the goal of praying it out is so that in the end, we arrive at the destination. Not my will, but your will be done. And I want love to win in me so that I can demonstrate love in the place of obedience. I want love to set me free from all of these ideas, self-crafted visions, definitions of success that aren't actually aligned with with God and, and his heart for me. I want love to actually win and to set me free. And, and I want to experience deliverance in the place of prayer where duty or obligation actually gets transformed and now with real joy and delight with with a confidence in God and a rest that I did not have before 
I can do the thing that he's asking me to do. And in doing the thing, I become a witness because power has actually transformed me. And that empowerment by God's grace that worked in me until he had to do the thing in me so I could actually do the thing made me a demonstration of what the love of God is able to accomplish in the life of a person when that person is given over in a process of prayer. And I prayed until God did it in me. I prayed until God had his way in me. I prayed until the power of his grace transformed me. And now with joy, I could say, I delight to do your will. Psalm 40, verse 8, I delight to do your will. Or I could rise from prayer and I could say, you don't understand, something's actually happened to me. Because now I'm not just going to do it to satisfy some objective. Now I'm going to do it and there's going to be a joy that energizes it. There's going to be an otherworldly infusion of joy that is going to bring me to life to where what I am demonstrating is not just for the externals. He's actually accomplished something on the inside of me, and it's real. And I believe that the Lord is looking for a people um, tonight specifically, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't make any sense. Um to come under the harness of love in a greater way. And I believe the Spirit and the Spirit's power is looking for greater traction in your heart and in your life. Um, Where, where yes, even down to God's interest in getting into the nitty-gritty, right? Like, Like the practicalities of our life where the Lord is looking for obedience. It revolutionized my life. When one morning I was complaining about getting up early to pray. And I heard the Spirit say to me, "Um, you actually don't have to do this. And I was like, oh. I mean, uh, yeah, I guess nobody's like forcing me to do this. He was like, but he feels loved by you this way. I was like, oh. It revolutionized my life. He feels loved by you this way. And and I wonder where his worth in our hearts is being tested. I wonder what invitation to obedience is being presented to you in this season or the mercy of God circling back around to provide us another opportunity to obey things that he's previously said, right? The, the encouragement of Jonah, who rebels, but God comes back around and in a merciful offering, gives him another opportunity to do what it is he already knows God has said. So I wonder in what way God is coming back around in mercy to remind us of things that he's already said that that maybe we've found convenient ways just to dodge. You know, at times, even just by telling someone else, right? Like at times, I don't even want to talk about it because it creates accountability that I might not want, right? I mean, I don't want somebody in my life necessarily always reminding me of what God said and why I'm not doing it. (laughs) You know, I mean, maybe it's circling back around to things that we've already heard, Or maybe it's things that we are in a fresh way being challenged by. And we understand the pressing that is upon our lives because of the love that he's looking for from us. Um, And I'm going to pray that the Spirit is going to touch our hearts tonight in a real way to give us abundant grace to love him and to love him well. And not just in any way that we might determine, but in the way that he's asking. And by the means of obedience that he's looking for. Um, A great way to say I love you is by obeying. Nothing says I love you like obedience. Because they that love me are those that obey me. And again, hear me, this isn't some 
taskmaster, you know, like Egyptian captivity, taskmaster, whip every day, like get to work kind of stuff. No, 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 I'm telling you, something radically changes when the affections of your heart come to life. And there are just certain requests that are impossible to accomplish unless your affections come alive. I get it. Until your affections come alive, it's difficult to walk with him and to love him the way that he's asking. But when your affections come alive, we're unstoppable. There's nothing that you won't do, nothing that you feel you can't do in order to evidence the way that he's touched you and what's happened on the inside. And so I'm gonna ask, just in the place of prayer tonight, for the spirit to touch our hearts, that he would get from us what he's looking for, and that the yes that he deserves, the evidence of his worth in the place of our obedience, that our lives would demonstrate what he's worth. Man, that's what life is about that our lives would demonstrate what he's worth. So I'm going to ask you, uh, just all across the room, let's, let's stand together. We're just going to take a few moments just to pray. And then I, I will ask us to respond uh, in a particular way. But before we do that, just right there where we are, man, just the consideration of things that have been shared and and in whatever way you may feel like the Lord is speaking to you, um, let's just turn our hearts in a more intentional way to the Lord. And just in the place of prayer, right there where we are, um, let's just open up the conversation of our heart, just between us and the Lord. Just between us and the Lord. Right, I asked, is there an area of your life, is there a space or a place where the voice of the Lord is off limits? Where you're you're unwilling to hear God in certain spaces? And that can be for a variety of reasons, I get that. But is there an area of your life? Is there a vision of your life? that possibly is being inconvenienced by the things that God may be saying to you or by whatever personal word of the Lord has come to you in this season. Let's just open up the conversation of our hearts. Lord, tonight our interest is we want to know you. It's why we've come together, we've gathered in your name. You said where two or three would be there in your name, gathered that way, that you would be in the midst. So we sense you among us, the power of your spirit moving on behalf of your heart for us, towards us, and your purposes being worked out on a global landscape. Lord, we, we know by faith, our confidence is that you're here. And Holy Spirit, we ask you tonight, even as we're here together, that you would, though we are many, that you would touch our hearts in a personal way, in an individual, unique, powerful way, that you would touch our hearts tonight. That your investigation of our delights. Let it be thorough. Our desire is to know you and to be yours. And let it be thorough. Search highest of the heights within us tonight.
Tonight, if you feel the Lord speaking to you and you know that either there's something he's asking you for or that just in a greater way, the invitation is to come up under the harness of love and, and you have it within your heart, a desire to say, Lord, give me grace tonight to love you the way you deserve to be loved.